And hello there. Welcome to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Camp Myers. We're here every week meeting interesting people and dealing with topical issues. Thank you for joining us. And on this week's show, we welcome back a frequent guest. Yes, we entitled this show an update from our governor. We're pleased today to welcome back to the set in the next segment, uh, Governor Mary Fallon, who's been with us a number of times before. She's going to kind of give us an update on what she's been doing and how the state of the state is going, and uh, we're really excited to have her. Lots of good news to report. Governor Mary Fallon, today's guest in The Verdict. We'll be right back. can offer is insight into understanding the Native American art, how these artists are expressing themselves as cultural people. I am Heather Ottone. I'm a Native American researcher and curator, and I am Chickasaw. I can remember in first grade the teacher saying, well, you're so lucky you don't look Indian. That was difficult to hear, because it was what I was, it's what I am. I think there's a renaissance going on amongst the tribes. I think the Chickasaws are leading that. We didn't die. We're not gone. So what are we now? And what can we do now to start to form that identity, to survive into another century? And to have the culture guiding us into that future, that would be significant. See more stories about the Chickasaw people at profilesofanation.com. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. Kent's going to introduce today's guest. As I indicated in the opening segment, we're really thrilled to have our governor back uh, for another visit on The Verdict. Incidentally, this will be her 10th appearance with us over a number of years in a number of different capacities. Uh, Mick likes to refer to her as the Rocky Marciano of uh, <laughs> the politicians because she is, uh, in any race she's run, uh, she's won. So she's undefeated uh, coming into uh, her second term here as governor. She served uh, two terms in the Oklahoma House of Representatives. She was the lieutenant governor for 12 years. She ter served two terms in the U.S. House of Representatives. She's the first woman governor of the state of Oklahoma, and she's now in her second term. Uh, while uh, in her first term uh, serving as governor of Oklahoma, she was elected by her state peers to be chairman of the National Gover Governors Association. Uh, she has, uh, as governor, signed into law many historic things, such as, as not limited to, of course, workers' compensation reform, lawsuit reform, and many other things that have advanced this state in a positive way. And we're really pleased to have you here. Welcome. Thank you, Kent. Great to be with you. Mayor, great to see you again. Likewise. You've had now, a good as, week. As this show airs just a couple of weeks ago, we were uh, at a Boeing groundbreaking. Kind of explain to the, to the average person just how long it takes to get these job creation in, in Senate packages and conversations to turn into an actual groundbreaking and the employees start arriving. It doesn't yeah. happen overnight. Absolutely. Congratulations to Oklahoma City and congratulations to you, Mayor. Yeah, we are very, very excited that Boeing has once again decided to expand in Oklahoma City and in Oklahoma. They, as I said at the event a couple weeks ago, they have different choices of different states and there are certainly very many competitive states that put together attractive um, packages, whether it's their workforce, whether it's their economy, whether it's their tax structure, and, and certainly even tax incentives go with that. But Oklahoma has been very competitive. As Kent mentioned, we've been working very hard to make Oklahoma very business friendly, to help the bottom line of businesses, providing a strong, highly skilled workforce, keeping our taxes low, great quality of life as the mayors work so hard to make Oklahoma City and surrounding areas such an exciting, fun, vibrant place, even for millennials, by the way. Yeah, they're coming in, in large numbers. Let me, let me bring up something, though. When you first kind of arrived on the scene, when I, when I and probably a lot of others first noticed you as a, as a political candidate and spokesperson, you were talking aviation. This was long before Boeing. I mean, this is, you know, 20 years ago. What made you so um, 
ingrained and, and why did you believe in the aviation industry and the future in Oklahoma way back when? Well, I appreciate you recognizing that. It was actually early on in my lieutenant governor years, and I was elected over 20 years ago lieutenant governor, but I knew that the defense industry, the military was very important in Oklahoma, all the supply chain the companies that were involved in supporting the aerospace industry was important to our economy. And so ba basically, Mayor, back years ago when I was lieutenant governor, I, I started a, an aerospace summit for the state of Oklahoma, and then I brought together our top leaders in the state that are involved in education to military to the private sector and put them together as a group to inventory our assets in our state and to look to see what kind of workforce we needed to develop to continue to sustain the aerospace industry so we could grow and support it. So back to your question about how long does it take to work on a Boeing, yeah. we've been working on this project for a while. <laughs> yeah, and, <laughs> and, and we've known about it for a little bit. When you look back at all the Air Force bases, that none have been affected by BRAC, and a lot of that I think is because we have worked so hard BRAC to make sure that, closings. yeah, that's right, make okay. sure that the workforce is around so that the military can be successful, because they got to have the civilian employees too. Well, tell us a little more about the, the Boeing thing, either one of you, since you guys well, kind of work together yeah, on it. She's together. the guest, but this gets us up to 3,000 employees in, in the Oklahoma City area. 3,000 oh. Boeing employees? Yes. Yes, yeah. so it'll get us up to 3,000. And we had a little bit of exciting news. Well, I should say a lot of exciting news. Mm -hmm. At the press conference, we knew about the 800 new jobs, the $80 million investment, the big facility we were breaking ground on. But and some of us had a little advance notice that we were also getting an executive division team of Boeing that will be coming to Oklahoma, which hopefully in the future, if we get the executives that are moving here, maybe some other business from Boeing will follow suit to Oklahoma. But you know, I, I don't go to Washington State anymore. <laughs> I'm not real popular up there. Maybe you're probably not real popular between the Thunder and Boeing, but I mean, we've been very fortunate because we've provided a great place to live, work, and raise a family where it's moving Boeing jobs from Seattle to from Los Long Beach, California to Wichita to St. Louis now. I mean, we're competitive as a state and we're attracting those businesses. Let's talk a little bit more about the jobs that are coming and what kind of compensation they will uh, reap. Huge, huge, good paying jobs and a lot of engineers. And that was one of the first things I did when I was elected governor was to pass an engineer's tax credit. And the Boeing executive told me just uh, recently that when they were recruiting people to move to Oklahoma and they told them there was an engineer's tax credit to if, if you were to go study engineering or if you were an engineer to move to Oklahoma, that was a huge factor, they said, in getting people to move to our state. What, what are roughly the salary ranges, uh, top to bottom, or however you'd like to express it on Yeah, what, the numbers I've heard were 90000 and uh, for wow. the average. That's a good job. And for then, the 800 job? For the 800, and then the, the 13 she talked That's about, um, it's several hundred thousand dollars per job. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Well, that kind of segues nicely into something I've been wanting to ask you about, and that's your Oklahoma Works program. Tell us what that is. Well, Oklahoma Works program is a statewide initiative, and I'll be ho hosting eight regional meetings beginning like, within about a week. And basically what we're doing is we're making sure that we have the talent pipeline to take care of our employers in our state. And so it also Oklahoma students graduating from high school, college, career tech, or even adults that are looking for upper mobility in their careers can have the applicable work skills needed for today and tomorrow's workforce. In other words, many times, Mayor, I'll talk to an employer who may say, I would expand my business, but I can't find a commercial truck driver, I can't find someone to work in my energy company, I can't find an aerospace composite technician or an aerospace engineer or nurse or whoever it might be. And so one of the things we're trying to work on is how do we align that pipeline to encourage our high school students to continue on with either a career technology certificate and they're good paying jobs, by the way, in what we call the middle skills gap, mm -hmm. uh, having a career technology certificate or an associate's degree, and certainly even encouraging four-year college degree and, and higher on up. And let me tell you why this is important. We know that right now in the state of Oklahoma, around uh, 45, 47 percent of our workforce has a high school degree. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit under half of everybody in Oklahoma has a high school degree, but we know Five years from now, which is not very long at all, 77% of our jobs in Oklahoma will require more than high school, either a career technology certificate, an associate degree, or college degree. 
So what we have is what we call a skills gap. It's about 23% mm -hmm. in our state. In other words, we don't have the appropriate level of skill and education to meet the needs of our workforce. And if we want to retain jobs and grow jobs and attract the Boeings or the GE Global Energy Research Centers or things like that, we have to have the skilled workforce, not only for our adults, but even for our children. And we all want our children, if they want to stay in Oklahoma, and we hope they do, to have the, a good paying job here. You've had Go some ahead. success in rural <clears throat> Oklahoma as well. It's not just Oklahoma City and Tulsa that are benefiting from the job. This has been such a fun year. We mm -hmm. actually have had a lot of business leads that we've been chasing for quite some time, and, mm -hmm. and we're beating other states. In fact, uh, we had a recent announcement of uh, 300 jobs in Durant, Oklahoma, Durant, I should say, Durant, <laughs> Oklahoma, for commercial metals. And we've been working on that project about eight months or so. And one of the things I do, Mayor, is I host them over to the governor's mansion when I get a big lead. I do it as much as I can, as much as I'll come, and serve them coffee and talk to them about how great it is to be in Oklahoma. But 300 jobs in Durant, it's a, a big thing. Mm -hmm. And here's the fun part, it was a Texas-based company that was deciding whether to expand in Texas or to come to Oklahoma. And we got them in Oklahoma. I read it, uh, all I know about is what I read in the paper, but th that's true about a lot of things. But uh, the article I read uh, on that point you just made indicated that they were planning on serving their Texas clientele from the Durant uh, facility. Yes. Which is kind of the reverse of what we're used to seeing. Absolutely. And that's very positive, it seems. Lots of other leads that we're chasing uh, right now that have been in the works for six to eight months. And there are times when you're working on these big things, as a mayor knows, they may have a list of 20 different states, even other countries that they look at and they narrow it down. And what I'm finding recently is, I mean, certainly Oklahoma City and Tulsa is very, very attractive, but we've got great leads for the rural sectors, and that's, that's exciting for our state. And of course, we always need to continue to diversify our economy, whatever type of industry it is. We're having a little bit of a slump with the oil industry right now, but we know through, that we go through these cycles, but expanding our economy is very important. You're now in your second term. How is a second term different than a first term? Well, the first term when I came in, Oklahoma had gone through the national recession. I, I took office in 2011. We had uh, a $500 million budget shortfall, and you've heard me say a hundred times, we only had $2.03 in our savings account. It's all true. <laughs> Unemployment was very high at that time, so we had a lot of challenges. So my first, first uh, four years, I really focused very hard on creating jobs, growing uh, our companies, uh, building a stronger educated workforce, working on issues affecting the bottom line of businesses, whether it's keeping our taxes low and reducing our taxes, reforming our pension systems so we can reduce our unfunded liability of our state, the workers' compensation, new system we set up, the lawsuit reform, a lot of uh, programs like Complete College America, trying to get more educated people in, in our state. But the second term, one, some of the things I've been working on is things that really holds back as a state. and so. I've been focusing on the educational attainment, which I've talked about just now. The second thing that you focus on, Mayor, has been the health and wellness of the state. And we don't rank as well as we should. We're doing better, much better, but we need to do better in our health rankings. And you, you had a program you announced putting the city on a diet, but <laughs> looking at health, wellness, uh, prescription drug abuse, we mm -hmm. passed a great piece of legislation this year to help with doctor shopping, uh, texting while driving, I think it was important. Non-smoking you know, in public schools, another bill we passed for health and wellness. And the third thing is just how do we keep people from going into our correctional facilities? How do we help them get a good paying job to stay clean, to stay healthy, and address the criminal justice issues? Yeah. We're going to take a break and be right back. She is Governor Mary Fallon, next on The Verdict. land to us is how we make our living. It's not an easy life. This land that OERB restored for me had pump jack stands, it had old building foundations with pipes sticking out of them. I could never have been able to afford to do these improvements like OERB did. They didn't just come out and put a band-aid on it, it's back to the prairie. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa. 
where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First, loyal to Oklahoma, loyal to you. Welcome back to the set of the verdict. We are welcoming in Oklahoma Governor Mary Fallon. You have a program called Oklahoma Works, and I know that ties into the recent Boeing announcements. Explain the, the details. Well, Oklahoma Works got started a couple of years ago when I was national chairman of the Governor Association, and when you're the national chair, you're asked to develop a national initiative that both Democrat and Republican and independent governors, we have one independent governors, governor, can work towards for the betterment of the nation. and. You know, we, we talk about companies having jobs overseas and bringing them back home and repatriating them and how we can grow our economies and, and raise our standard of living in our nation. And one of the ways we do that is through developing work skills. So I launched a program called America Works Education and Training for Tomorrow's Jobs. And I focus all the different governors in the states on aligning our K through 12 with our career tech and our higher education and the private sector along with the Commerce Department to use specific data to develop that talent pipeline. So you took the <clears throat> idea, developed it in, in your position as the uh, president or chairman of the National Governors Association and brought it back to Oklahoma in Oklahoma Works. We are the model state in the nation and people are following our lead. Let me uh, change the topic just a minute. There's been a lot of uh, publicity recently about uh, an Oklahoma Supreme Court decision dealing with the Ten Commandments monument at the state capitol. Can you comment on that? Absolutely. Well, first of all, I don't have an order as a governor to remove right. the Ten Commandments monument, and that will be up to the, the court, the judge, to, to decide when that is. But at this point, I don't have an order. You know, I, I personally said I wasn't going to take it down until we have to by a court order with a specific date. And I, I believe it's a historical document. I, I know that my calls my office around about 18 to 1 saying, you know, it's an important part of our history. We got in God we trust, you know, in our dollar bills. You got the Moses with the Ten Commandments on the U.S. Supreme Court, you know, office buildings. I mean, it's, it's an important part of our culture, our history, and our system of laws, um, you know, based upon um, our history of, of the Ten Commandments in our nation. If we if it's, it looked to me like the uh, Oklahoma Supreme Court seized on not so much the U.S. Constitution but the Oklahoma Constitution provision dealing with that topic. Uh, there's been some talk about trying to uh, reform our own Constitution to deal with that either by removing it or rewording it or something. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, that's, that's true. In fact, I had a meeting with our Attorney General who's been very involved with this, Scott Pruitt, and our Speaker Jeff Heckman and, and Pro Tem Brian Bingman just recently talking about the whole subject because I do think there will be legislative movement. In fact, I guess there's already a bill that's been filed even though the legislature's not in that would repeal the Blaine Amendment, send it actually to a vote of the people of Oklahoma to decide do you want to repeal the Blaine Amendment which the Oklahoma Supreme Court has interpreted that it's, it says that we cannot have the Ten Commandments on our state grounds. Now the interesting part is our Ten Commandment monument mirrors almost exactly the one that's on the Texas State Capitol grounds, which was upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court when it was challenged to be permissible. Mm -hmm. So the question is the Blaine Amendment, which is particular to the Oklahoma Constitution. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Um, recently shootings in Chattanooga at the State National Guard's offices. I assume that concerns you and, and uh, could happen anywhere. Absolutely. You know, it's unfathomable that we would have 
anyone who would ever go up to a National Guard facility or any type of military installation in our nation and would do such horrible crimes and, and shooting anyone or even threatening their lives. And it's also it's also hard to even imagine how we send people into harm's way overseas and we let them have a weapon to defend themselves. But in the United States, if you're in a military uh, National Guard facility, you can't have a weapon. Hmm. And so I wasn't I, aware of that. So I, ins yeah. I instructed our Oklahoma National Guard to evaluate our installations, to look at our processes, to make improvement on security and to allow where they deemed appropriate and those who are trained and qualified to be able to carry a weapon to protect our National Guard members. Mm -hmm. And that's already begun in Oklahoma. And there are other states following suit, I think. Have a lot of states. In fact, we were the first state in the nation to do that. And I recently went to the National Governor's meeting and had a lot of uh, governors saying, I wish I would have thought of that idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were just slow to, <laughs> slow to do it. Well, um, <clears throat> what kind of, uh, Put on your visionary hat uh, now and uh, tell our viewers what kind of changes in state government would you make if you had the power, if you were the dictator, you had the power to change whatever you wanted to, to make this a better state. How would you change state government? Well, one of the things I've really been trying to focus the legislators attention on, and, and they are focusing on this, I'm very proud of what we did this session, is to look at how we spend our money in the state of Oklahoma. It's taxpayer money that we work hard for, that we pay taxes to support important services in our state. But how do we budget that money? How do we allocate that money? We, you know, one of the things I keep stressing is we don't want to allocate money on things we hope might work. And I know you've been very involved in, in defending children with the Children's Legal Defense uh, groups programs that we know will work and mm -hmm. do work. In other words, don't waste your money on programs that just aren't working. Let's focus the money on things that will make a difference in improving the, the lives. And so we've initiated what's called performance-informed budgeting, setting goals, setting metrics, measuring data, having the outcomes, and actually publishing mm -hmm. it to uh, the, the public. Well, when you bring up things that just don't seem like they're working, I guess what comes to my mind is, is corrections. And, and it, you know, it filters down to local governments, too. I, I, you know, we're we're uh, working on issues at the Oklahoma County Jail and, and the inefficiencies there and how do we fund it and are we, you know, do, are we programming it the right way? And, of course, you're looking at 77 counties and a statewide penal institution and, and system that's difficult to change, but obviously change is necessary going forward. Well, it is, Mayor, and, and I was reading an article recently that Arkansas is having the same debate, you know, mm -hmm. overcrowding in county jails, overcrowding in, in their prisons, the amount of people that are in prison in, in our system. And we absolutely want to keep people that are a danger to society mm -hmm. and a danger to our families or even our businesses locked up and do their time. But one of the things I've really been emphasizing is that we do know that we have a high prescription drug abuse problem in our nation and we have a high prescription drug abuse problem in Oklahoma. We have cases of mental health and people that are in our corrections facilities they have mental health issues so they have a mental health issue they go off their medication they go perpetrate a crime. We have um, those that are just criminals to begin with yeah. and so how do we distinguish between someone that has a substance abuse problem an addiction issue that's not a criminal but just doing stupid stuff that we get mad about versus someone who may have a mental health issue that needs to be addressed or someone that's truly a criminal that we need to keep off the streets and put away so they don't harm people. And that's what we've been working on over the last couple of years. It's called the Justice Reinvestment Act. We passed some great legislation this year, mm -hmm. which I think will make a difference in, in how we can help people be more productive, but yet also keep our community safe. Well, there's several other things we could talk about, but we have run out of time. Thank you, Governor, for coming by and being well, on board. Well, my Alberta. pleasure. It's yes, always you're great always to see both here. of you. Well, thank you. You guys do a great job. Kent and I will have a final word when we get back. There are now 11 million of us who live here and work here. I was 15 when I came here six years ago. I raised my family here, drive my truck to my job every day. The only difference between now and six years ago, I do illegally. I wanted to because this is my home.
All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. You will always be mom and dad to me. I think for us, once we got started and we began to see the tremendous need um, just within our state, um, it really was just a calling for us. The blessings far outweigh any obstacles that we've faced. You will always be mom and dad to me. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. And for almost 30 years, Oklahoma political, government, and business leaders have turned to the McCarville Report for accurate, reliable, inside information. Visit the McCarville Report online. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers, and we are wrapping up the show with Oklahoma Governor Mary Fallon. It was really a pleasure to have the governor back joining us again for the 10th time, not as governor, but the 10th time over the years. And uh, she has uh, been recognized by the populace of Oklahoma to be a valuable public servant over and over again. And in every job she's had, as different as they have been, she has excelled. So we're really lucky to have her in, uh, governing our state. So much change has occurred, and, and I guess the way you sum it up is a lot's been done, but there's still a lot more to do. Yes. And, and, you, and you, you see her working with the legislature and trying to instill real change, and it's difficult when you have you know, institutions that have been in place for decades, change is difficult to accomplish. Well, one thing she has always done, no matter what her job has been, is to make positive changes, mm -hmm. and that seems to obviously be continuing. We have some website information for you, more information on the governor at ok.gov slash governor, and we have a website. It's theverdict.tv. Visit our website and tell us about a guest you'd like to see or a topic you'd like to see us discuss. We'll see you next week on The Verdict.